the eternal curious and the literature of the mystery? Why the detective story, to entertain, to interest, to amuse, and to puzzle? An excerpt from the Technique of the Mystery Story by Carol Wells, first published 1913. Why is the detective story? To entertain, to interest, to amuse. It has no deeper intent, no more subtle raison d'etre than to give pleasure to its readers or puzzle them, for there is really a practical utility in puzzle solving. Regular exercise is supposed to be as necessary for the brain as for the body, and in both cases it is not so much what we do as the doing of it from which we derive benefit. It has been argued that its awful examples, sometimes very awful, are meant as cautionary pictures to restrain a possible bent toward the commission of crime. It is held by some that the habit of analytical and synthetical reasoning requisite to appreciate the solving of these fictional mysteries is of value in training the mind to logical and correct modes of thinking, the practical application of which, in the everyday affairs of life, proves a valuable asset in the worldly struggle for success. According to Mr. H. E. Dudney in the Canterbury Puzzles, there is really a practical utility in puzzle solving. Regular exercise is supposed to be as necessary for the brain as for the body, and in both cases it is not so much what we do as the doing of it, from which we derive benefit. Albert Smith, in one of his amusing novels, describes a woman who was convinced that she suffered from, quote, cob wigs on the brain, end quote. This may be a very rare complaint, but in a more metaphorical sense, many of us are very apt to suffer from mental cobwebs, and there is nothing equal to the solving of puzzles and problems for sweeping them away. They keep the brain alert, stimulate the imagination, and develop the reasoning faculties. And not only are they useful in this indirect way, but they often directly help us by teaching us some little tricks and wrinkles that can be applied in the affairs of life at the most unexpected times, and in the most unexpected ways. There is an interesting passage in Praise of Puzzles in the quaint letters of Fitzosborne. Here is an extract. The ingenious study of making and solving puzzles is a science undoubtedly of most necessary acquirement, and deserves to make a part in the meditation of both sexes. It is an art indeed that I would recommend to the encouragement of both the universities, as it affords the easiest and shortest method of conveying some of the most useful principles of logic. It was the maxim of a very wise prince that, quote, he who knows not how to dissemble knows not how to reign, end quote, and I desire you to receive it as mine that, quote, he who knows not how to riddle knows not how to live, end quote. But though all this may be true as a vague result, it is not the author's real purpose. He writes solely for entertainment, presumably the entertainment of his audience, but often equally for the entertainment of himself. Inquisition into the curious is universal. The detective story, and now we include the whole range of mystery or riddle stories, is founded on a fundamental human trait, inquisitiveness. Man is an incarnate interrogation point. The infant's eyes ask questions before his tongue can do so, and soon the inquiring eyes are supplemented by a little outstretched hand, trying to satisfy a curiosity by the sense of touch. But, once having achieved a vocabulary, however small, he uses it almost entirely to make inquiries, until so prominent becomes this trait that his conversation is cut off altogether, and he is condemned to be visible, but not audible. Attaining further intelligence, his inquiries become more definite and thoughtful, though no less numerous and eager. He seeks books, whether in or out of running brooks. He inquires of authorities, or he reasons out answers for himself, as he grows in body and brain. He meets a friend in the street. He pours out questions. In his business he progresses by one question after another. Is he an inventor? He questions of nature till he probes her various secrets. Is he a philosopher? He questions his soul. To quote... Mr. Dudney again. The curious propensity for propounding puzzles is not peculiar to any race or to any period of history. It is simply innate in every intelligent man, woman, and child who has ever lived, though it is always showing itself in different forms. Whether the individual be a Sphinx of Egypt, a Samson of Hebrew lore, an Indian fakir, a Chinese philosopher, a Mahatma of Tibet, or a European mathematician makes little difference. Theologian scientist and artisan are perpetually engaged in attempting to solve puzzles, while every game, sport, and pastime is built up of problems of greater or less difficulty. The spontaneous question asked by the child of his parent, by one cyclist of another while taking a brief rest on a stile, 
by a cricketer during the luncheon hour, or by a yachtsman lazily scanning the horizon, is frequently a problem of considerable difficulty. In short, we are all propounding puzzles to one another every day of our lives, without always knowing it. An orator makes his best effects by questions. The book of Job is impressive, largely because it is written in interrogative form. Many trite quotations are questions. What is truth, or is life worth living? Arrest our attention because they are debatable queries. Who is not more interested in the questions of the day than in the known facts? According to Mr. George Manville Fenn, the man who invented a wondrous and mysterious plot for a story deserves a palm. He must have been a deep thinker, one well-versed in the philosophy of Goose Quill, knowing that his story would thrill the reader, and that he had achieved the great point of seizing upon that reader's imagination and holding it so that he would follow the mystery of the fiction to the very end. It may have been the result of some haphazard lucky thought, but still he must have been a careful student of everyday life and must have duly noted how largely curiosity or the desire to fathom the unknown is developed in the human brain. As with other human traits, inquiry is inherent to a greater extent and also more largely developed in some minds than in others. Some people say, how do you do, and wait interestedly for your answer. Others say, how are you, and without pausing for reply, go on to remark about the weather. But it is the people who are interested in answers who care for detective stories. It is the people who care for the solution of a problem who write and read mystery tales. One who has studied these questions from many points of view, and above all, noted how a story will catch on, and almost electrically seize the imagination of the reading world, will constantly see that, in the majority of cases, the most popular fiction of the day is that in which mystery plays a prominent part, a mystery which is well concealed. This is no secret. It is the natural desire for the weird and wonderful that hunger for the knowledge of the unknown, which began with the forbidden apple, and the practicer of the art in question merely grows for those who hunger a fruit that is goodly to the eye, agreeable to the taste, and one that should, if he or she be worthy of the honored name of author, contain in its seeds only a sufficiency of hydrocyanic poison to make it piquant in savor. It is no forbidden fruit that he should offer, merely an apple that is hard to pick, a fruit whose first bite excites fresh desire, whose taste brings forth an intense longing for more, and of which the choicest and most enticing morsel is cleverly held back to the very end. As Mr. Dudney observes, it is extraordinary what fascination a good puzzle has for a great many people. We know the thing to be of trivial importance, yet we are impelled to master it, and when we have succeeded, there is a pleasure and a sense of satisfaction that are a quite sufficient reward for our trouble, even when there is no prize to be won. What is this mysterious charm that many find irresistible? Why do we like to be puzzled? The curious thing is that directly the enigma is solved, the interest generally vanishes. We have done it, and that is enough. But why did we ever attempt to do it? The answer is simply that it gave us pleasure to seek the solution, that the pleasure was all in the seeking and finding for their own sakes. A good puzzle, like virtue, is its own reward. Mem loves to be confronted by a mystery, and he is not entirely happy until he has solved it. We never like to feel our mental inferiority to those around us. The spirit of rivalry is innate in man. It stimulates the smallest child in play or education to keep level with his fellows, and in later life it turns men into great discoverers inventors, orators, heroes, artists, and, if they have more material aims, perhaps millionaires. But the kernel of their interest is resolution. A mystery and its solution, designedly set forth in narration, implies a previous sequence unknown to the reader. It is this re-solution that attracts the alert brain and stimulates the reader to solve for himself a problem whose answer he will shortly learn but he wants to learn that answer as corroborative proof of his own solution, and not as a revelation. It is this instinct great in some small or perhaps even entirely lacking in others that makes a mind interested in puzzles or mysteries. Early riddles. The enjoyment of puzzles or mysteries is as old as humanity itself. First, there is the ancient riddle that draws upon the imagination and play of fancy. Readers will remember the riddle of the Sphinx, the monster of Boeotia, who propounded enigmas to the inhabitants and devoured them if they failed to solve them. It was said that the Sphinx would destroy herself if one of her riddles were ever correctly answered, 
what animal walks on four legs in the morning, two at noon, and three in the evening? It was explained by Oedipus, who pointed out that man walked on his hands and feet in the morning of life. At the noon of life he walked erect, and in the evening of his days he supported his infirmities with a stick. When the Sphinx heard this explanation, she dashed her head against a rock and immediately expired. Puzzle solvers may be really useful on occasion. Then there is the riddle propounded by Samson. It is perhaps the first prize competition in this line on record, the prize being thirty sheets and thirty changes of garments for a correct solution. The riddle was this. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. The answer was a honeycomb in the body of a dead lion. The classic riddle of the Sphinx is mythological rather than historical, and belongs to the Grecian deity, not the Egyptian Sphinx. Its date is unauthenticated, but at least it wears the halo of antiquity, for Sophocles wrote of it in the 4th century B.C. Samson has been called the father of riddles, but merely because his famous riddle was among the first to creep into print. Doubtless older and better ones were buried in an oblivion from which they can never be disinterred. Out of the Eater, propounded 1200 B.C., does not strike us as an exquisitely clever conceit, but it embodies the true principle of the riddle and of the riddle story. The asker already knew the solution, and that was why the guessers strove to attain a re-solution. In those days, riddles were proposed at wedding feasts and other social gatherings, a practice still obtaining to a degree. The Queen of Sheba came to visit Solomon to prove him with hard questions, and Solomon, in his turn, was addicted to the giving of riddles to Hiram, king of Tyre, who was fine for those he failed to guess. Among the Egyptians, puzzling was a religious rite, and the Sphinx was their goddess. We are told that such was the esoteric religion of the Egyptians, that all the priests were riddlers, and their religion one vast enigma. Other recorded ancient riddles are of interest to the antiquarian, but enough has been said here to prove the inherent love of question and answer in man's mind from the earliest ages. From earlier than Samson to later than Sam Lloyd, the puzzle has held its own among mental activities. And puzzle, in its broader sense, includes all branches of mystery or detective stories, as well as mere riddles or conundrums. The Century Dictionary defines puzzle as a riddle, toy or contrivance, which is designed to try one's ingenuity, the passion for solving mysteries. This is the crux of the mystery story. It is designed to try the reader's ingenuity at re-solution. The exercise of this tried ingenuity is what gives the entertainment or amusement found in a mystery story. The type of mentality or the kind of mental bias that gives pleasure in puzzling is the same in author and reader. The talent that knits is the same talent that unravels. The propounder uses the same kind of acumen as the guesser, and his pleasure in doing so is of the same sort. It is difficult to say just what this mental faculty is, but we who possess it know that its exercise gives us exquisite enjoyment. As the athlete rejoices in his muscular prowess, as the musician rejoices in the melodies he makes, as the artist glories in his painted masterpiece, yea, even as the clam is notoriously happy in his own element, so the mental acrobat revels in concentrating all his brain power on an analytical problem. Lowell declared that Poe had two of the prime qualities of genius, a faculty of vigorous yet minute analysis, and a wonderful fecundity of imagination. These two qualities are present to a greater or less degree in every lover of mystery fiction, and it is the degree that determines the intensity of the call of the author and the response of the reader.